Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Thank you, Father, for the blessings that you give us. Thanks for loving us and uh, calling us to be your children and gathering us together so we can study your Word and fellowship together and worship you through, through our study and through our music and through our fellowship. We trust that you would always be honored by what we say about you and, and how we live. Thank you for, for each member that's here today and for the, the joy that we can share with each other. We love you and we want to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're continuing in, uh, in who and what is God. And we're in a section called Special Revelation. And we're in, a, in the section of Special Revelation on various methods, visions, dreams, research, study, etc. How God's revealed himself uh, throughout history. When you, when you think about how God revealed himself, you know, there's, we had the general revelation, nature and so forth. And uh, I've always been amazed that people can look at nature and not see God. Or if, it, if they don't see God, see somebody that made it. I mean, obviously there's, there's systems in place, and systems require system programmers and so forth. And so general revelation is, has always convinced me that there has to be something. I understand the intelligent design movement that views only to a, a theist level that there is something. There, the intelligent design doesn't go far enough to say that it's Jehovah God who we can have a relationship with. But in special revelation, there are ways that God has communicated, and we've looked at some of those already, and through people and through, through his specific word, um, scripture, but there are also other things that God uses, visions, dreams, our research. As you study something, sometimes God reveals to you the truth that he wants you to know. So um, what is perhaps the most significant dream revelation you can think of in Scripture? Daniel, okay. Okay. I'm sorry? Well, certainly, except John, I think John experienced that. I don't think that was, it was a vision in, in the same sense. Thank you. That's, that's the first one that comes to my mind all the time is Joseph. I mean, remember the story of, of Joseph and his, uh, I like saying Technicolor dream coat, not accurate, but he had visions that he would one day be at the top and everybody would be bowing down to him. And since he was already the favored son, all the brothers said, no, that's not going to happen, and they, they sought out to kill him because he saw a vision. And, and then they sold him into slavery, and he sees visions in, in, his, uh, in his role in, in Egypt, eventually becoming prime minister because he interpreted visions. The vision God gave him that, hey, there's going to be a big famine, so store up now. And uh, he ended up saving his family because of that. And that, to me, is the, is the most significant vision. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told to his brothers, they hated him even more. I, I love that. They hated him even more. It wasn't they hated him because of the vision. They hated him even more. That, to me, is fascinating, that they just really didn't like him. Of course, Daniel, we, we have Daniel and, whoops, wrong, Platon, stop that. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after which appeared to me, uh, after that which appeared to me at the first. Of course, Daniel had a number of visions, and that gave him some 
added credibility with the uh, with the king and with the uh, the the leaders of the of the magicians and so forth. Or we can go back to Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abraham, "Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I'll show you, and I'll make you a great nation, and I'll bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing." Now. I might argue with the author of this uh, material a little bit. I'm not certain that that was a vision for Abraham. We have a lot of times in the Old Testament God appearing, whether it was a Christophany or a Theophany, whether it was an appearance of God the Father or an appearance of Christ, is, is open to debate. I would argue there are no Theophanies, only Christophanies, but um, somebody appeared to Abraham, I think, rather than just gave him a dream. And he, uh, he responded to that. Or we can go to uh, Luke chapter... Oh, there, Luke, Luke chapter... I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. I'll bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the fa- uh, families of the earth shall be blessed. Of course, that's a, that's a, a statement we ought to th- continue to think about today. We were talking about it last night about the, the, the overwhelming anti-Semitism view um, in the world, it, it, to me, has always been unnatural. And that tells me that it's demonic in origin, that Satan has worked to make the rest of the world hate Israel, because Israel is the deliverance for, for the world. Through Israel comes the deliverance for the world, so the world wants, Satan wants the world to hate uh, Israel. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Dr. Luke is giving an account of his research. Besides being a medical doctor, Dr. Luke was a, was a very well-skilled historian. And he set about interviewing the various apostles and players in the story and got well-documented reports of what happened. Dr. Luke was not a participant in the Gospels. He wasn't there. He didn't see that. I believe Luke was a Gentile making him, I believe, the only writer, a Gentile writer of, of Scripture. I believe he studied and learned and, and, and talked to people and did just like I did when I was a detective. Did interviews and got the information and compiled a narrative. This guy looked at it from this point, this guy looked at it from this point, and so those two narratives, they come together in a collection, and we call that the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And Obviously, because they are scripture, they're God-breathed, but how did God influence him to write those? I think in two ways. We know that inspiration is that that work where the Holy Spirit inspires the writer of scripture to write exactly what God wants him to write, in exactly the right way, with the right words, and... Every time they wrote, they still used their own, their own vocabulary and their own style and so forth. You can see a definite style difference between Luke and Paul, say. But those were exactly the words God wanted them to write. So it wasn't like Luke just took dictation. It wasn't like he went into his room and there was, a, there was God and he said, take a dictation. And then Luke started writing exactly what God said. It's different than that, but it includes that. God gave him every word to write, but every word that he wrote was his. Now, I know that doesn't make sense, but there's a lot, of, a lot about Scripture that doesn't make sense. We believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. That means it, it was it, the words were given, and every word was given. So it is, it is both Luke's word, and God's word, in the case of Luke and Acts. And I believe there's a third volume of Acts or of uh, Luke's account that we don't have. Because Acts 
you know, in Acts chapter 28, we'll get there eventually on Sunday morning, is just uh, endly abru- abru- abrupt, endly, endly abrupt. Nice. Wow. And so I, I think there's a third, a third volume that we don't have. Maybe God's pre- uh, preserved it in, in heaven and we'll get to read it then, but I don't know. So Luke was, was listening, and all the writers of Scripture were listening, but I think Luke is the most fascinating writer of Scripture because he didn't experience any of, or most of what, none of what's in the Gospel and most of what's in, in Acts, he didn't experience firsthand. He did experience some of the times with Paul firsthand because he traveled with Paul. For others, their writing or the revelation from God um, was developed differently than Luke developed. Luke developed a, a research and then prepared his report. The Apostle Paul, he writes letters most often in response to other communication dealing with issues at the particular church. Paul had never been to Rome when he writes to the, writes to the Romans, and he's addressing issues. When he writes to the Corinthians, he's addressing multiple issues in the church. And so it's developed a different way. And so sometimes they're developed as a, as a response to an issue. Sometimes they're a sermon. Sometimes they're a, a, a personal communication. Uh, the, book of, the letter of, to Philemon is, is a personal communication dealing with a, a hurt that he had because he lost Onesimus, his slave. And Onesimus came to know the Lord and came uh, to Paul. And Paul writes back to Philemon and says, Hey, I got your guy here, but you need to show him a little grace. And so forth. The book of Hebrews is a topical book. It's, it's, we don't know who wrote it. I personally think Barnabas wrote it, but I don't know. Um, and, and it's all about addressing what the new church of Jews needs to understand as they relate Christianity following Jesus to the Old Testament, and to most, like, most importantly, to the Levitical law. It, it argues that the new covenant of Christ are better than the law and uh, the shadows of the old covenant. So uh, years ago, you remember, we, uh, I wanted to teach through Hebrews, and before we did Hebrews, I taught through Leviticus. So we had an understanding of what the law was before we tried to look at the law from a Christian Jew's viewpoint. Psalm 110, verse 4, The Lord has shown and will not change, has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Then you can go into Hebrews 7. And Hebrews 7 talks a lot about Melchizedek. More is talked about Melchizedek in Hebrews than in the Old Testament. But the author of the book of Hebrews is drawing a parallel. Abraham goes out to to, uh, give the king of Salem, ultimately would be Jerusalem, Melchizedek, an offering, a tithe. He He was respecting him. And so the author of the book of Hebrews draws that parallel and says, Jesus is not qualified to be a, a, a priest after the order of Aaron because he was from the tribe of Judah. He was not from the tribe of Levi. He wasn't from the family of Aaron. He wasn't qualified to be a priest. But he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who was introduced to us in Genesis at the time of, uh, of uh, Abraham. Wayne Grudem, one of the uh, one of the great theologians of our day, modern theologians, um, sums up the process of revelation this way: In between these two extremes of dictation pure and simple on the one hand, and ordinary historical research on the other, we have many indications of various ways by which God communicated with human authors of Scripture. In some cases, Scripture gives us hints of these various processes. It speaks of dreams, of visions, of hearing the Lord's voice, or standing in the counsel of the Lord. It also speaks of men who were with Jesus and observed his life and listened to his teaching. Men whose memory of these words and deeds 
was made completely accurate by the working of the Holy Spirit as he brought things to their remembrance. As we see in, in uh, John 14.26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all the things and bring to your remembrance all the things I have said to you. Dr. Grudem goes on, in many, way, in many other uh, cases, the manner used by God to bring about the result that the words of Scripture were his words is simply not disclosed to us. Apparently many different methods were used, but it's not important that we discover pre precisely what these were in each case. In cases where the ordinary human personality and writing style of the author were prominently involved, as seems in the case of, uh, with the major part of Scripture, all that we're able to say is that God's providential oversight and direction of the life of each author was such that their personalities, their backgrounds and training, their abilities to evaluate events in the world around them, their access to historical data, their judgment with regard to the accuracy of information in the individual circumstances when they wrote, were all exactly what God wanted them to be. So that they were actually, so that when they actually came to the point of putting pen to paper, the words were fully their own, but were also fully God's. Exactly what God wanted them to write, words that God would have us also claim to be his own. So, kind of a long quote, but Dr. Grudem tells us exactly what we've been talking about, how God reveals in multiple different ways, in, including ways that we don't know and can't understand. I find it fascinating. I, I spend a little bit of time studying the inspiration of Scripture just because I, I find it fascinating. I, and I always want to figure out how something works. I think Harper will be the same kind of way Caitlin was. She always wanted to tear things apart to see how they work. And, and I love doing that in Scripture. How God can superintend in the mind of the author of Scripture so that the author of Scripture is writing exactly what he thinks and what he feels, but those, those thoughts and feelings are given by God. By the way, that's how God brings you to the point of salvation. He does exactly the same thing. He gives you the desire to want to be saved. Because apart from him doing it, you don't want to be saved. And so it's, it's part and parcel of the same process. And to me, that's a fascinating thing. That I can do something on my own volition that God gave me. Spend a little time ruminating on that and you'll just go cuckoo. Considering all this, one might ask, does God still speak through dreams and visions? Do you think God still speaks to us today in the same way? Okay, we've got one no. We have others? Okay. That's true. At least you should. Sometimes we suppress that. Does God re is God revealing in the same way? I'm going to say no, in that I'm talking about Scripture. God is not giving us Scripture anymore. He concluded that. When the age of the apostles, when the apostolic age came to a conclusion at the end of the, or at the, end of the book of Revelation, no more Scripture is being given to us. Now, that does not mean that in subsequent dispensations, God won't again reveal. But we understand what he said to us in Scripture to tell us that in this dispensation, he's done. We've got all we need to know in order to affect salvation and so forth. So from the standpoint of, is God giving us Scripture? No. Is God revealing stuff to us? Yes. Is it new stuff? I don't think so. Will there be a time when prophecy, God revealing something you can't know except he reveals it, comes? Yes. But in this age, we're done with that. I think. Now, that is not a, uh, a position that everyone takes. Um, the, the charismatic and, uh, and uh, Pentecostal movement certainly doesn't take that. Um, but there are some conservatives as well that 
believe that maybe God is still revealing some new truth to us. I, I, I can't see that in Scripture. But he will again. Because you don't know everything yet. You can't know everything about God yet. So there is still more for God to reveal, but he's, I believe, told us he's not going to do that, do that now. We can go to Revelation chapter 22. Where John writes, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in the book. And if anyone takes away the words of this book, uh, of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So, most scholars interpret John 22, 18 and 19 to be a reference to not just the book of Revelation, although that would not be an inconsistent view with, uh, with what's ri written there. They take it to mean that since this is at the end of the Bible, the last recorded revelation from God, that he's talking about all of the Bible. All 66 books. That if you add to it, you're in trouble. If you take away from it, you're in trouble. And so when I, when I look at a passage like that, I get kind of afraid about what I teach, that I can't teach something that's not there, and I can't not teach something that is there. Did I get too many knots in there? Maybe. So my job is to teach it all, Genesis to Maps. And there's no part that I get to skip over. Before I retire, I want to have taught all of it. I don't think I'll get there because I don't teach fast enough. But there's still a lot that has to be taught. We could go to Jude, verse uh, 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about common our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, the English, the normal English reading of that verse would say, faith, our belief, our trust in God. But that's not what's, what was written. That, it wasn't written for you to understand it that way. What is, what is another idea of the use of faith in the New Testament, the use of the word faith in the New Testament? It is the body of what we believe. What was once for all delivered to the saints? God's Word. When John comes to the end, it's, it's now the late 90 A.D.s, nearing 100. John is the last apostle standing. And about 95 to 97 A.D., he writes the book of Revelation. When that's concluded, when he's done, when he writes chapter 22 and he writes don't put anything in, don't take anything out. God concluded his revelation of Scripture to us, and it's our job to, to contend for it, to protect it, and to deliver it. That's what the author of, uh, of Jude is saying. He wanted to write something about our salvation. That's, how I, that's one way you know that what's being said here is not a reference to your salvation faith. Look what he says. Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation. I can't. I found it necessary to write to you, appealing to you to contend for the faith. For the body of what you know. The body of what you've been taught. The body of what God has revealed, once for all, delivered to the saints. There's evidence that God has come to an end of revealing Scripture to us. Now, there's, there's no Scripture that tells us, I, God, am done. God doesn't have a the end period at the end of the book. So we have to interpret verses that give us that indication. And I think both Revelation 22 and Jude 3 give us that indication. His primary method of speaking will always be through in our, in this age 
will always be through His Word. God has given to us His Word, and we talked about this a little last week. This is why I believe that when the perfect comes, is not necessarily specifically a reference to God's Word, but to God's Word's writers. When that's complete, when John dies, the apostolic age ends, the prophetic age ends, and we have a completed book. That's why before that, we had miracles that proved that was from God. We had signs that proved it was from God. Now you just have God's Word. And so if somebody stands up and says something, you don't have to have a miracle to authenticate it. You can just go to Scripture. Does it agree or disagree? If it disagrees, it's wrong. That's a bold statement. But I'll always stand on the side of Scripture. You know from my studies of, of creation that I side with Scripture over everything else. The scientists can tell me 4.7 billion years. And I can still interpret Scripture to say that that's not true. And not violate scientific principles. And I'll always stand with the Word of God being the foremost authority. If something conflicts with the Word of God, whatever that something is, it's wrong. And I don't care if 9 out of 10 scientists say that. I don't even care if 10 out of 10 scientists say that. Look at what Paul says about himself in uh, 1 Timothy 1.13. Oops. I missed the path. I'm sorry. Step back for a minute. Jesus uh, uh, spent time with Paul. He began, begins on the, on the road to Damascus where he, he says, what are you doing? Why are you kicking against me? And then I believe, remember, we taught that uh, Paul spent three years with Jesus in the wilderness. So go to Acts chapter 9, verses 3. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. So formerly I was a blasphemer. Oops, I'm stepping ahead of myself, sorry. This is what, what happens when I don't write my own notes. So Paul is, is, is recounting, or Dr. Luke is recounting for Paul, how God intervened in his life. And Paul said it's no way possible, as a Pharisee, he said it's no way possible that Jesus could be alive, therefore all of you guys are blasphemers. And so Jesus stands in his way on the road to Damascus and said, why are you doing this? I have to imagine that as Paul looked up, and saw Jesus there, he saw the, the nail holes and, and so forth, that he recognized who he was. You see, I believe since, since Paul was a, a disciple of Gamaliel, who learned at the feet of Gamaliel, Gamaliel was one of the prominent members of the Sanhedrin, I believe Paul was either a member of the Sanhedrin or was in the room when Jesus was, was tried. So he knew who Jesus was. He, he had, had, had visible sight of him. And now, after persecuting him because he didn't believe he could be alive, there is Jesus alive, standing there talking to him. His whole world was shaken. That was a special revelation to the Apostle Paul. He then goes on in, in uh, 1 Timothy, Though I formerly was a blasphemer, per, uh, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Oops, that's too far again. Paul says, look, I was doing what I was doing because that's what I'd been trained to do. He was a Pharisee. The law of the day said you can't be God because here, O Israel, our God, he is one. Jesus can't be God. He has to be a blasphemer. I think we give too much grief to the Jews for their response to Jesus? First of all, if they didn't respond that way, you wouldn't be saved. If they had accepted Jesus when he offered the kingdom to when we studied Matthew, we saw this. If they had accepted him when he offered the kingdom to them, he wouldn't have died, and if he didn't die, none of us would be saved. 
course, we know God's plan included all that, so that couldn't happen, but he offered the kingdom to him, uh, to them. And Paul was a good Jew. He was a great Jew. He was a very legalistic Jew, but that's what the system demanded. It's like saying you've got a, a harsh Roman Catholic German mother. Well, duh, that's what they are. They can't be anything else. And so Paul was exactly what he's supposed to be. And then he meets Jesus and he goes, everything that I learned before now is invalid because I understood that he couldn't be God and there he is resurrected and is God. So Paul says, look, I received grace and mercy because I acted ignorantly. He didn't know the truth. But God revealed the, the truth to him. No doubt when God saves this way, it's an act of mercy for every one of us. For Paul being saved, it was an act of mercy not just for Paul, but think about all the people in the last 2,000 years that have been impacted by Paul's salvation. Right. So how did that occur? How did it occur that, that Paul became susceptible to Jesus there? Exactly. I would imagine that as Paul was arresting Jews, he saw something in them that he couldn't explain. And in doing that, he recognized something. Oh, clearly, yeah. yeah. You don't go from being a, a pharisaical zealot to falling on your face and recognizing Jesus in just a moment. There, there, there was a process the Holy Spirit was working on him. Because he had to have years of training disrupted. Now, the Holy Spirit does that for all of us. We all have preconceived notions. I mean, Romans 1.18, you know, we suppress the truth because we don't want the truth. And we can't handle the truth. Always wanted to say. And, and so the Holy Spirit does that work. How he does it is different probably for all of us. As a Catholic, as a, as a kid going to Catholic school, I went to confession every morning. Because I was afraid. That's what was instilled in me. And then to, to, to come to know at the age of 11 that God actually has mercy and grace, that was kind of cool. That was not what I knew before. And so it was a process. God has orchestrated... To me, salvation is the most fantastic miracle you could ever dream of. Because since Adam and Eve, God has been orchestrating, before Adam and Eve, God has been orchestrating every event of every person to give them experience and, and uh, education and training and, and uh, thoughts that include the Holy Spirit working at various times until the, the day that he's, he's decided that he decided back before the foundation of the world that you would be saved. And who would be there to help you? Who would be there to, to hold your hand or to nudge you or to, to push you, whatever it was? The Holy Spirit has that all worked out and is working in your heart. And then at the right time, he gives you the faith to believe. And then you believe. It's, it's a complete miracle. Um, in theological terms, order salutis is what order things happen in for your salvation. You know, does, does God give you, give you faith and then you believe and then you're saved? Or what exactly order does that happen in? That's a, that's a fantastic study. But the bottom line is, God does it all and, and encourages you and pushes you and gives you the faith and then you believe. What did you do? 
You didn't do anything. The only thing you bring to the equation is your filth and sin. God gives you all the rest, which to me is, is fantastic. So for Paul, it was a tremendous mercy. And I think it's a tremendous mercy for us that Paul was saved. I mean, look what we know about what the church is to be because we have the writings of Paul. What would we know about doctrine if we took the Apostle Paul out of the New Testament? We'd know some. Peter covers quite a bit of it. John covers some of it. Hebrews wouldn't make sense if we didn't know Paul. So what would you have? You wouldn't have a ton. God, knew what he, God knows what he's doing. So, are there applications that we, can, that we can take from God offering, uh, often choosing to use various methods? One of the encouraging applications I think we can take from the various methods of special revelation is that God speaks and ministers to people differently. How God influences me is different than how he influences you. I'm kind of a geek, so when I'm studying theological things, not only will I, will I study the, the, the text of Scripture, but I'll also study theological journals. I get a subscription every year to a, uh, a service that aggregates theological journals. Uh, I think this year they have 37 different journals, and they have every volume that those journals have published. So if you're a, a, a Bibsack viewer or a reader, they go back into the mid-1800s. There are thousands of journal articles in um, Biblica Sac Sacrathea. I can never say it right. One of the greatest theological journals out there. I think, I think Elaine once bought Chuck a subscription to that. Yeah. It's a fantastic journal, and, and I have access to all of those. It costs, costs 50 bucks a year, but I, 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 I read theological journals like a lot of people read uh, fiction reading. It's not unusual for me to have five or six downloaded and working on it at the same time. And, and God uses that to influence me in how I interpret Scripture and so forth. God uses other ways to influence me. He uses people that I talk to, including non-saved people. I have a, a few guys that I've been working with for, for several years, and, and we have conversations about theological topics. And they're not saved, but they have opinions on stuff, and it helps me understand what, what the world sees. So God speaks primarily, or God spoke primarily through visions and dreams, uh, or I shouldn't say primarily. God spoke that way. Does he do that today? Well, maybe. I'm not a good candidate to know that because I don't ever remember my dreams. Rarely when I wake up do I remember if I've, if I've dreamt. And when I, when I look at, you know, I wear a, I wear a ring at night that monitors my my pulse ox and my my uh, my pulse and uh, my movement and it can track sleep states. I rarely have enough REM sleep to actually dream much. And uh, if God speaks to me in dreams, I'm not hearing it. Now I'm different than others. Some of you may dream really well, and maybe God speaks to you that way. Or like Elaine talked about earlier, maybe you feel the nudging of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit saying to you, do this. There's somebody sitting over there that needs to have a friend. Go over and talk to them. That's not just you saying that. That's the Holy Spirit talking to you. First, or 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13, or 12 and 13. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me, in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them, went on to Macedonia. So here's a case where Paul 
is wanting to go in a certain direction. He thinks he needs to go that way. But the Spirit tells him, no, go this way. And we see that recorded in the book of Acts frequently. People come to God and expect them to speak to them audibly. I don't know that God's doing that nowadays. I mean, we know in the Old Testament he did that. We know that there were cases in the New Testament where he did that. But I don't know of any case that, that I can legitimize, validate, during the church age, where God speaks to us audibly. Now, that is not to say that there are not appearances of the resurrected Jesus still going on. I'm not sure. And I don't find any evidence in Scripture to say yes or no. You know, the movie we watched the, uh, a couple of weeks ago, that kind of gives you the impression that, that uh, what was his name? Dan? Maybe. The guy that showed up? That, that maybe that was Jesus. I don't know. Maybe it was an angel. I don't know. Dave. I was close. Yeah. So, does Jesus appear to people today? Maybe. I can't prove it one way or another. I know a lot of people would like to have uh, Jesus appear. I certainly would like to sit down and have a conversation with him. Like, uh, can you imagine what it was like for, for, for Paul on the road to Damascus? It would be kind of cool for Jesus just to walk in the door and, hey, let's have a conversation. Okay, let's sit down and have a conversation. That would be the coolest thing ever. We have some examples in Peter and John. Don't be discouraged about how God relates to others or how they experience him. Trust God, God's faithfulness to you. We see an illustration of this when Christ restored Peter at the end of the Gospel of John, John chapter 21, verse 19. This he said to show by what death he was to glorify God after saying this he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them and the one who, had, uh, who also had leaned back against him during the supper. And he said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter said to him, he said to, uh, when, when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the point of of that is how God deals with you is different than how he deals with somebody else and don't you be jealous of what they have and they shouldn't be jealous of what you have you concentrate on you the common thing to say today is you be you you do you you build your relationship with God in however way you relate to God how you communicate with God I've discovered in my, in my morning time, sitting out in front or out back with my cup of coffee after the reading and stuff, that praying through the attributes of God has changed my view of God. If I spend some time just thanking God for his attributes and then mulling those over in my mind, I think he communicates with me you know, this morning I was, I was mulling over his sovereignty. That's a big deal for me, the God's sovereignty. He's sovereign in everything or he's not sovereign in anything. If he's not sovereign in everything, he's just lucky most of the time. And that's certainly not a good position for, for a God. But mulling that over, I get, this, I, I get this sense of his strength and I get the sense of his connectedness to me and that none of what goes on around me is an accident. The nutball in the White House, I'm sorry, the president nutball in the White House is not an accident. We're all afraid of what's going to happen, but don't be because God's in control. He's sovereign. And I found that, that spending time in the morning, starting my day by thinking about who he is and what he does and what he, what he, what he exists as, 
day before yesterday, I was I was sitting there and Friday morning, and I was I was praying and I was, I was thanking God for His being transcendent. And then I thought, what does that really mean? And so I spent some time thanking God for Him being outside of time and space, which I can't comprehend. I can't comprehend being outside of time and space. That all of time is the same time to God. I all of a sudden got such a sense a sense of relief. I don't have to worry about anything because all of time is the same time for God and He's got it all under control. What happens tomorrow or the next day or the next day is not a concern because He's not in time, He's outside of time, and He's got it on, under control. Nothing surprises Him. So, try that sometime when you pray in the morning, assuming you do. Just consider the attributes of God and then spend a little time. I think my mulling those things over is communication and, and is prayer with God. Paul says pray without ceasing. How do you do that? Like this all the time? You're going to die on 41 if you're praying. So don't do that. But you can still pray while your eyes are open and you're doing stuff. And I think mulling those things over is part of that. So Jesus tells Peter, don't you worry about it. Just do you. Okay, I need to stop. Holy cow. Holy cow. I could get on a roll, couldn't I? We'll, we'll pick up next week, Lord willing, in Theophanies. Thank you, Father, for the blessings you give us. Thank you for loving us. We love you, and we're constantly amazed at who and what you are. Thank you for the opportunity to study that. Give us a, a great service to follow in Jesus. In Jesus name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.